Hello, I'm Chris Parker with ParkerPhotographic.com and this Lightroom Classic tutorial is all about editing your images. So you're gonna learn some pro tips on how to use the develop module to edit your images, an overview of every editing tool in Lightroom Classic and more. And because of that, this tutorial is quite long. However, we can't go into every possible scenario and go into great detail about every editing tool. Otherwise, we would be here for hours and hours. So make sure to check out the links in the description to learn more about specific types of editing. And if you are ready, let's do it. All right, to get into the develop module, you can either come up here and click right here or press the letter D. Now, just like with the library module, we have a left and right panel and our film strip is down here at the bottom. All right, so since this is a Lightroom Classic editing tutorial for beginners, we're gonna skip all these panels right here except for presets since they're used to edit your images. So the question is, what is a preset? A preset is a saved set of photo editing settings in Lightroom that transforms your images with just a click of the preset. You then have the flexibility to adjust the settings that work best for that particular image and your creative vision. Now, Lightroom does come with some presets for free once you install Lightroom for the first time. I also have a bunch of presets here that I've created for myself and some of these are free as well. All you have to do is check out the link in the description to download around 150 presets and no email is required. So check out the link in the description below. All right, so let's go ahead and open up my retro collection right here. I'm also going to select this image that I shot at the Eloise Psychiatric Hospital in Michigan. And as I begin hovering over each image, it's going to show you what that edit is going to look like based on the settings that were saved in that preset. If we take a look at the basic panel here, we can see the edit settings that I've applied so far. And then once I click on a preset, those edit settings will be updated accordingly. I can go back with Command or Control plus the letter Z. And if I choose another preset, then those edit settings will be applied. Now, I don't have to undo that. I can go ahead and click another one to update those settings accordingly based on that preset and the edit settings saved inside of it. Okay, so let's go ahead and check out the editing tools here in the right panel. And at the top, we have a visual representation of the luminance and color values of your image in the form of a histogram. So the histogram consists of five different parts of your image's tonal values, starting with the blacks on the left side, followed by the shadows, midtones, highlights, and whites. So the midtones is actually the exposure in Lightroom Classic. But if we take a look at the basic panel here, we can see in the tone section, we have exposure, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. And then we can use these to adjust the tonal values in our image based on what we need to do for that particular image. And we also have a contrast slider here. If you want to increase or decrease the contrast, you can do that with this contract slider here. Now, to learn more about the histogram, check out the video tutorial link in the description below. All right, so this particular image is extremely underexposed in the bottom two thirds of the image here. So I may want to increase the shadows and the blacks to bring out the detail in that part of the image. So I'm gonna go ahead and slide the shadows slider here to the right, and then that detail will be revealed in the shadows. I can do the same with the blacks to bring out more detail if I wanna do that. Now, if you're unsure where to start your editing, go ahead and click on this auto button right here and Lightroom will use its AI technology to compare your image among tens of thousands of similar images and auto magically edit your image. Now, sometimes it will give a really good result like for this particular image and sometimes not so good. Either way, auto is a great place to start. Now, another thing you can do is you can create an HDR image among three different exposures, which I wanna show you right now. I'm gonna go ahead and undo this with Commander Control plus the letter Z. And we can see I have three different images here with three different exposures. So same scene, different exposures. Now I did that because I knew that the dynamic range of the scene was really high. And that's because in the gorge here, the sun wasn't shining any light inside of there. So in order to capture the details and the highlights, I had to expose for the highlights. And then I created another exposure 
to start showing the detail or capture that detail in the gorge. And then this one here shows the detail more than the other two, but the highlights are now blown out. Now we can take these three images once we have them selected. And if we go up to photo, photo merge and HDR, Lightroom will merge all the details from all three exposures and give you a high dynamic range image or HDR for short. Now I've already done this. So I'm gonna go ahead and cancel out of this and we can see my HDR image here, which is very similar to the result that we got with the auto button here. So you can use either option depending on if you have multiple exposures or not. Either way, I would start with auto to get you started editing your image. Now these edit settings that Lightroom provided after it created the HDR file are not the exact settings it gave me. I went in and I tweaked these settings based on my personal preference. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the histogram and let's go back into the basic panel here up at the top because we have a couple other things we haven't covered yet. We have treatment and next to that we have color and black and white so you can convert it to black and white or back to color if you change your mind. All right, so next we have one of the most overlooked edit settings in Lightroom Classic, which is your profile. Now, this is one of the first editing settings you should do before anything else. Now, in Lightroom Classic, a profile is used to interpret your raw file into the colors and the tones that you see. And that interpretation was created by someone else who says, your raw images colors should look like X and it should have an X amount of contrast. So in a way, profiles are like Lightroom presets. They both have editing information saved to it and will adjust your image based on those edit settings. Both profiles and presets are non-destructive as well. The difference between the two is you can change the edits applied via presets but not with profiles. So think of profiles as a starting point for your editing. Based on the profile, it applies a certain amount of contrast, color, saturation, and tonal adjustments. Now, if we click right here, you're gonna see the profiles provided by Adobe, but if you click on browse, you will find camera matching profiles. So these are profiles created by the camera manufacturer based on your camera. And then you can hover over each one of these to see how that profile will affect your image. All right, so under that we have your white balance. In essence, the white balance is used to adjust the color of light in your image. Now with the white balance tools, you can remove color cast so that the whites, grays, and blacks are a pure color. For example, if there's a hint of yellow in the whites, blacks, or grays, that would be a yellow color cast. Now for this particular image, because it was shot at sunrise, it has that golden yellow color, which is a natural color in nature at this time of day, whether it's a sunrise or sunset. So we have our white balance eyedropper tool right here. And once you click on it, it will activate that tool for you. And this is going to allow you to click on any color and remove that color cast within that area. So if I hover over the clouds here, you can see that we have a creamy, brownish, yellowish tone to the pixels that I'm hovering over right now. Now also take a look at the percentages of those red, green, and blue numbers at the bottom of that grid. And you can see that the red is the dominant color, which is why it's warmer in that particular area. Now, once I click here, it's going to adjust the white balance and now those percentages or those numbers are closer together. They're almost identical. And as you can see, the result, once that color cast is removed, the image is cooler or more blue or bluer, which is unnatural for this time of day. So we don't always want pure white in our images. It all depends on your particular image and whether or not you want to remove the color cast. Now for this one, I don't. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave it as is, which is this color temperature right here, 5200, which is what I captured in camera. Now, if you didn't capture the white balance that you wanted for a particular scene and you don't want pure white, you can adjust your temp from this slider here 
So to the right, it will become more yellow, to the left, more blue. And then you can adjust the tint as well to add magenta or green to the image. We also have some pre-made white balance options inside of this menu here based on different lighting conditions. Now, this is only going to be visible if you shoot in RAW. All right, so the last section in the basic panel is your presence settings. So we have texture, clarity, and dehaze. And when you apply these, it's going to give the appearance that your image is sharper and it's going to target different elements or tones and details in your image depending on which one you use. And I have a separate video tutorial that goes into great detail on how to use all three. And you can find the link to that in the description below. Next, we have vibrance and saturation. So saturation is going to increase the purity of that color. And if you remove saturation, and once you go to minus 100, it's going to strip that color completely in every tonal range of your image. And I bring that up because vibrance is slightly different from saturation. It is going to boost the colors in the image, but if you go to minus 100, it's not 100% black and white. So it's still applying color in your midtones, your highlights and your shadows just a little bit. So it's applying the colors in a different range of tones versus saturation. All right. So our next editing tool is the tone curve, which is an advanced tool to precisely control the contrast in your image. Plus you can also use it for removing color casts or adding them depending on your creative vision. Now I did mention in the basic panel here, we do have a contrast slider, but that's more restrictive versus the tone curve. So the tone curve will allow you to apply the contrast specifically in different parts of your tonal range. So we have our blacks and shadows on the left, midtones in the middle, and then highlights and whites on the right. Now there's a lot of things that you can do with the tone curve and we're not gonna cover everything right now. I do have a complete guide on the tone curve that you can find the link to in the description below. All right, so to use the tone curve, you can click on that linear line and then drag it to curve that line. And then you can increase the brightness by dragging up, or you can make your image darker by pulling it down. You can also add as many anchor points as you want to manipulate that linear line based on what you need to do for your particular edit. So if I click and drag this up, that's going to target the highlights. If I click and drag this one down, that one's going to target the shadows. Now I have what is known as an S curve, which is a popular type of tone curve that creates contrast in your image. The more you pull down or the bigger that curve, the more contrast you will create. I prefer a subtle amount of contrast. So I'm going to go ahead and pull these back in. Now by default, if you take a look up here, this gray circle is the activated tool for the tone curve. So this is the luminance of values. And these are the RGB color channels that you can target with different adjustments to alter the colors in your image. And you can target those colors in specific parts of the tonal range by adding different anchor points. So now the color red is being added in the highlights. All right, I'm going to go ahead and reset all of those back to the original. And we're going to take a look at HSL now. So HSL stands for hue, saturation and luminance. And these will allow you to target eight different color channels to either change the color, which you can do with hue. So if I adjust the orange here, you can see that the colors are changing in the image. Saturation will change the purity of that color. And then luminance will increase the brightness of that color or make it darker. Now, the other thing I want to point out is if you go into the basic panel and convert to black and white, the HSL settings have changed to black and white. So now you can target the eight different color channels for your black and white, and you can then increase or decrease the brightness of each of those different color channels which will give you a much more custom creative type of black and white. And this is my preferred method of creating black and white images. All right, next we have the effects panel. And from here you have a few options for creating a vignette. So all of these sliders will help you customize 
that vignette based on your creative vision. Now, if you want to create more of a vintage or retro type of effect, you can add some grain and increase the size and roughness with these sliders here. The next editing panel is the detail panel. And from here, you're going to sharpen your images and remove digital noise. So let me share with you some pro tips on how to use these so you don't over edit your images. Otherwise, if you do, you're going to degrade your image. So let's take a look at this photo of my daughter here. And I'm going to increase the sharpening to the maximum, which I don't recommend doing. I'm just doing this to show you what happens with sharpening when you apply it and how to target where that sharpening is going to be applied in your images. So you can also increase the intensity of the sharpening with radius and detail and then masking will allow you to remove that sharpening in different parts of your image. So I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in here so we can take a look. So we can see that her skin is really grungy looking and the imperfections in her skin have been enhanced with sharpening. Now, of course, if I bring this down, it's not as bad, but I just wanna show you what happens with your masking tool. So if I slide this to the right, it's going to begin reducing that sharpening along the skin. Now it's easier to see when you hold down your Alt or Option key. And then when you click on the masking tool, it will turn white. And as you adjust to the right, black will be introduced. So anything in black is not receiving sharpening. So when we apply sharpening, we want it to be along the edges of detail that are important to the image. In this case, the skin, although important, it doesn't need to be sharpened because we don't want to enhance those imperfections. We want to sharpen the eyelashes the eyebrows and the hair in the image. Now, when it comes to landscape photos, you're going to want to apply this masking as well because we don't want to sharpen the blue sky. Otherwise, we will increase the grain, the noise, and the digital artifacts will become more apparent in the sky when you begin sharpening something that doesn't need to be sharpened, like the sky or the skin. All right, so I'm gonna pick out another image so we can take a look at noise reduction. So this is a dark eyed Junko that I captured later in the day and it was a low light situation. And because of that, I had to use a high ISO of 5000. And if I zoom in, you can see all that digital noise in the background here that kind of looks like grain, film grain. Now, if we take a look at the noise reduction section here, we have two types of noise that we can remove. Color noise is going to be color specs. Now, these are the default settings and it did a really good job of removing that color noise. If I set this back to zero, you'll see that color noise as colored specs. So depending on your camera, these default settings may or may not work. If not, you can increase or decrease the amount to reduce the color as needed for your particular camera. Now, luminance noise is going to get rid of this grain that's in the background. So as we adjust to the right, it will begin smoothing out that grain or that noise and that will give the appearance that it's gone, but it's not going to always get rid of it 100%. The further to the right you go, it creates another problem, which is you begin to lose detail. So if I set this back to zero, you can see we have a lot of details in the feathers, but the further right I go, the more of those details are lost. Now by default, detail is set to 50 and you can increase the detail and contrast sliders here to try and bring back some of that detail. But the problem is it's going to begin bringing back some of that luminous noise and also create digital artifacts. So there's a better way to remove digital noise in Lightroom. And I've created a video tutorial that you can find in the description below. So check out that video tutorial via the link that I've provided. All right, next we have lens correction. So let's go to another image here again. And this time I have a photo of a bridge. This is Brant Street Pier in Burlington, Ontario, which I took a few months ago. And we are going to take a look at lens correction and transform for this particular image. So I already have the remove chromatic aberrations and enable profile corrections activated which is going to remove lens distortions and chromatic aberrations. So all you have to do is turn this on. It's not really going to show in here because there's not any chromatic aberrations, but there is some lens distortions in here. So the lens distortions that it's going to fix are barrel distortions, which is going to distort the edges and mostly the corners of your image. And 
it's going to create a vignette in the corner. So if I turn this off, you will see that the corners are not as dark when it's turned on. And when it's turned off, it's much darker. Plus, if you take a closer look at the corners as I turn this on and off, you're going to see that the corners are expanding or the image is expanding into the corner. So that's fixing that barrel distortion. Now, because I'm using a raw file, Lightroom is able to determine the make and model of the lens used. And then it has a pre-built profile that will fix that distortion. Now, if it's not fixing it exactly the way you want, you can use the distortion and vignetting sliders right here. And if you're shooting in JPEG, you're not going to have this option. So you'll have to do it manually. Okay. So color grading is a more advanced type of color editor that will allow you to target your colors in your tones and the shadows and the highlights and the mid tones. So these can be used for creative purposes, cinematic effects, or removing color casts that you couldn't do with the white balance adjustment. So this is a more targeted type of color adjustment for precise colors. All right. So the other thing I want to show you with this particular image is the transform panel. So this is going to fix some additional distortions that can happen with wide angle lenses, especially when shooting architecture with straight lines or any other type of man-made objects that have a straight line. Now, if I turn this off because I've already applied my adjustments here, you're going to see that the pillar is leaning here and we want to straighten that out. And we can do that with our transform tools here. I always start with auto because that usually gives me a good place to start. And then I will adjust these sliders here to further refine the adjustment. All right. So the final editing panel in here is the calibration panel. Now, this is another advanced color editing tool that provides precise micro adjustment controls over the colors of your raw files. So these sliders allow you to change the mixture of red, green and blue within each pixel to something that provides a better result based on the lighting conditions of your image, or it can be used creatively based on your creative vision. So you're going to have to play around with these to find out if these are tools that you want to use for editing the colors in your image. And then at the top here, we have a process that shows versions one through five. So version one is the tools and features and algorithms that we had available in Lightroom one back in 2007. And if you click on it, you're going to notice in the basic panel here that the sliders here are different versus version one. So if you ever have any problems and you're not seeing the correct tools, make sure you have version five selected. All right. So there's one more thing I want to mention before we move on to the editing tools and the toolbar here. And that is these panels here. These editing panels are considered global editing tools and these are considered local adjustment tools. So you'll be able to target your image with these local adjustment tools to precisely control where the edits are applied. Whereas these, in general, are going to target more of the image, of course, depending on the tool selected. So let's take a look at these local adjustment tools next. Now, this first icon here, that's not really a tool. If I go ahead and turn on my crop tool here and then click on this, it's going to deactivate that tool. But it's not really necessary because you can click on your escape key to deactivate that tool as well. All right, let's take a closer look at the crop tool next. All right. So the crop tool comes with a variety of features and tools to help you crop and straighten your images. Now, the other thing we have with the crop tool are overlays and the overlay that you're seeing is probably different than what I'm showing you right now on my image. And we have overlays that are based on different composition rules. This one being the rule of thirds. Now to cycle through the list of different overlays, press the letter O and that will reveal the next overlay in the list. Now, this particular overlay here is going to show you how your image is going to be cropped based on the aspect ratio selected. So right now I have original, which is this outer box or outer rectangle right here. So that's four by six or eight by 12. If I choose a different aspect ratio inside of this menu here, let's say five by seven, that would be this box right here. Let's go back to the original so you can see that. So 
we have the 5 by 7 right here or 11 by 14 and then 4 by 5 is also 8 by 10. So if I do 8 by 10, it will then show me the crop for that particular aspect ratio. So just keep that in mind when you're choosing your aspect ratio because it's going to crop out parts of your image based on the ratio selected. Now to crop your image, you're just gonna grab a corner or a side or both to crop in tighter and then you can click in the center here to recompose your image as needed. And if you click on the outside here, you can rotate your image if your image is crooked. But I prefer this little angle tool right here. We also have a slider. But if you click on this angle tool, it looks like a ruler. You can click on the horizon, drag out to match the angle of the horizon, and then it will automatically straighten it out for you. Now, once you have it cropped exactly the way you want, click enter or return. I'm gonna go ahead and undo that because I preferred my other crop. Our next local adjustment tool is right under this icon here. It kind of looks like a Band-Aid. And these tools here are used for retouching your images. Now, because we have these advanced editing tools in Lightroom, I can now do 95% of my editing or my retouching in Lightroom versus Photoshop. So we have three tools that are available in Photoshop as well, but it's nice to have them in Lightroom. So we have our content aware brush, a healing brush and a clone stamp brush. Now, although we get the same results as we do in Photoshop, they work a little bit differently in Lightroom. So if you wanna learn how to get the most out of these tools, check out the video tutorial that I created via the link in the description. All right, so next to that, we have our red eye tool and I need to select this image here that I found online because I didn't have an image with the red eye here. So red eye correction is going to fix this red that happens when you use direct flash when you're taking photos of people and animals or pets. And for your pets, it's going to be green in color instead of red. So if you're photographing a pet with direct flash and you have that green color, make sure you select pet eye from here. We're gonna select red eye because this is a human after all. And then all we have to do is click and drag around that red color and Lightroom will automatically remove the red eye. All right, I'm gonna go back to this photo of my daughter here. And our last set of editing tools is inside of this circle here. These are the AI masking tools. So these masking tools are a way to make a selection of something in your image that you wanna target and edit to. So subject is going to select a subject and it's going to select the entire subject. I'm gonna go ahead and undo that because if you take a look down here, we have another option and when I click on that, it's then going to separate different parts of the person into different masks once you click on create mask. How cool is that? It's awesome if you ask me because now I can go in and apply edits based on this new editing panel we have here to just her hair. If it's maybe too dark, I can bring it up. I can add some contrast down here in presence to add a little bit of sharpening to that part of my person, my daughter. So that's a pretty cool option for editing your portraits. Now we also have a tool here to create a mask for the sky. So it will auto magically select the sky and then you can go in and make adjustments to that sky according to your creative vision. Another awesome masking tool. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that mask. And the other one we have here is background. So it's not going to work on that one because there's not a definitive background, but for this one, there is. Actually, let's take a look at this hummingbird here. And if I select background, it will auto magically select that background for me. And now I can go in and darken up that background to help that hummingbird stand out a little bit more. Now there are additional masking tools inside of here as well. We can select objects. We can use a brush for more precise control over where that mask is being applied. We have a linear gradient, also a radial gradient, and then you can make a mask based on a specific color range based on the eyedropper tool and clicking on that area will then select those colors that you clicked on. And you can also make a mask with a luminance range or a range of brightness levels. All right, so there's a whole lot more to learn about all of these masking tools. We haven't even scratched the surface yet, so make sure to check out the playlist in the description below 
to learn more about these masking tools. Now, once you've completed your editing, it's time to share your photos with the world, and that's going to require you to get the images out of Lightroom, which can be done with the exporting feature of Lightroom Classic. To discover how to do that, watch that video tutorial next.